May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Deborah is a powerful woman and a powerful judge whose story is shared in the book of Judges. Deborah is one of just four female judges mentioned among hundreds of men who held that title. Biblical judges are not what we think judges are like. They were often warriors who were leading forces on the field of battle. They weren't known as reflective, thoughtful jurists sitting on high, considering the intricacies of the law and judging one case after another. Although, thoughtful words were part of their judging portfolio. However, Deborah is different. She is special. She is thoughtful. She is reflective. She is unique to the judges of her time. In Judges 4, 1 through 7, she is sitting under her palm tree to deliver her brilliant opinions to the crowd. She is a poet. She's a prophet. The song of Deborah found in Judges 5, 2 through 31 has been put to music through the ages and is still recited today. She is a judge of and for all the people. She clearly loves her people and her people love her. But there is so much more to Deborah. She is also a mighty warrior who commanded great armies of men and used her strategic power in defeating her enemies. She's a poet under a tree, and she's a mighty warrior yielding the sword of justice. In a recent article in Christian Century, one of my classmates at Yale Divinity School, a great theologian, author, author professor, friend, now president of Union Theological Seminary in New York City, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, penned an article entitled a judge arose about the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice of the United States Supreme Court. It is a personal article in which Dr. Jones shares the story of dinner in March, not that long ago, a dinner with Judge Ginsburg. In the piece, she speaks of the notorious RBG's love of Deborah as one of her early role models as a Jewish girl growing up in Brooklyn, New York. Comparing the two, Dr. Jones speaks of the poet, the prophet, the judge, the warrior, and our beloved late Supreme Court Justice. She writes, we aren't told anything about Deborah's height, her family, and where she grew up. As scripture sums it up, her job as judge, simply put, is to do everything in her power to make sure the people are true to the covenant they have made, their constitution that binds them, even when being true means battle. She is a mighty protector, referred to in the Bible as the mother of her people. Sounds like RBG to me. Our five foot one Supreme Court justice was a defender of the covenant and the constitution and was unafraid to go into battle with her black robe, the mantle that she wore across her chest, you know, the lace mantle, and her pen poised for poetic and prophetic entreaties on justice for all. About Deborah and Ruth and in each generation we can say, a judge rises and works to bend the moral arc of the universe. Under her palm tree, or on a bench with eight other colleagues balancing the scales of justice in America. Each woman is a powerful witness for justice and an inspiration and a role model for women throughout time. Deborah for Ruth and Ruth for all the rest of us. But Judges is much more than a story about one woman. It is a story of God acting in history in today's passage from Judges, we are in battle, but more than a military action, we find ourselves immersed in the full force of an ancient tale of God's forgiveness and mercy coming out of intense struggle and conflict. Here we encounter the oppressive consequences of human sin 
embodied by King Jabin and Sisera. But in Barak's victory, we also witness God's concern that oppression should never be permitted to stand. Overcoming oppression and evil is the purpose and the meaning of being God's people. Let me say that again. Overcoming oppression and evil is the very purpose and the meaning of being God's people. Here we see that the power of God is always exerted for justice and righteousness. God's power for good is powerfully communicated in the book of Judges. God is the most powerful judge of all. God's power is at work in a different way in today's gospel reading in Matthew 25. Here we receive a parable about investment. This is the power of the plate at work in the world. Let's be clear, this story deals in big money. In Jesus' parable, the master divided his treasure among three servants. Lest we feel too sorry for the one who received only one share, consider that a talent was a measure of weight denoting about 70 pounds of silver or gold. And given Jesus' storytelling style, it most likely was gold. The poor servant who got only one talent received the equivalent of about $2,172,800 in today's money to work with while his master was away. So if you do the math, the one who got five had over $10 million. And the one who had two had over $4 million. So the one who had won and buried it went out and buried $2 million in the backyard. It's hard to imagine the master's disappointment in the third servant. But he hand, as he handed over to him a significant amount of the portion of his life's work, and the thir servant thought so little of him and his projects, which he, by the way, says in the story, that he does absolutely nothing with it. He doesn't even ask someone else to use the money and get some interest on it. He just buries it. Now, I don't know about you, Reverend Corzine, but we're asking the church to step forward and give with generosity through the power of the plate. And what if Mark and I went out and dug a hole in the backyard of First Church and put the money in? Not just for one year, but for two years. We didn't give any away. We just kept it safe. I think you might be upset, Reverend Corzine. I think the rest of the church would be upset. If that's what we did, I'm sure none of you out there would be happy if the money that you gave as an investment in the justice work of First Church was buried in a hole. Okay, let me go on. This is a story about financial activity. It's a story about investments. When we talk about talents here, we're talking about the measure of money. We're not talking about the ability to sing or to dance, to paint or to teach to play an instrument, or compassionately care for members or neighbors. We're talking about a huge sum of money, which would have equaled more than two lifetimes of payments to those who were hard at work. The man wanted his money working for him while he was away. He was a capitalist who expected a return on his investments. But Matthew inserts language in this parable that changes it from a pure investment story into a kingdom of God story. We move from returns on in the investment portfolio to questions about eternal life or eternal damnation. Remember the gnashing of the teeth and sent into outer darkness? That's bad. We have been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew throughout this entire pandemic. We know a few things about the Gospel writer by now. We know he inserts spiritual truths into the parables and loves to remind us about the final judgment of God. Don't worry, there's one more week coming, the final, final judgment. It feels clunky sometimes. It feels like we're cruising through a story and then we take a sharp turn to the edge of eternal damnation or a sharp turn to the edge of eternal life. We have strong moralizing drop on our heads when we thought we were just hearing a story about investment. As a preacher, it feels sometimes like I'm driving a car down a mountain with no guardrails and no brakes. 
And by the way, lots of other cars on the road. I feel like Mr. Toad's wild ride. So let me gently apply what breaks I still have left as we head into Matthew's gospel. I want us to, to see the great messages that are here, but I'm just going to look at two things in the time remaining. First, we need to invest well in what we believe in. We need to invest well in what we believe in. I believe in First Church. It is my deepest hope and prayer that you believe in First Church too. I believe that we are a light to the nation. I believe we are a heart of hope in the, in the center of the city in these dark and challenging times. I believe that we have a mission and ministry dedicated to the compassionate care of our neighbors and our neighbors in need and our members. We have a special place in this world. We have invested in our church to make it come alive in the days and years ahead. That's what we do. That's who we are. And I hope these words from Lee Briggs and Brittany Strickland Hilliard, our 2021 uh, annual stewardship campaign co-chairs, help you. Let me share three important paragraphs that they sent to each one of our households just a few weeks ago. They're words about a vision and the times we're living in and, a wor and words for proportional giving. They wrote, the year 2020 has been like no other in the history of First Church. Amen. They didn't put the amen in, I did. Our nation feels more divided than ever. We have been apart more than we have been together. We have worshiped online in new ways. The staff, council, and commissions have carried out the business of the church in new ways. During these uncertain and unsettled times of COVID-19 and the heightened awareness of systematic racism in our nation, we grieve as a community of faith. We also recommit ourselves to living out our call as Christians to fight against racial and socioeconomic disparities in all areas of life. Through this, First Church remains a beacon of faith, hope, and love, loving generously. First Church draws from our deep faith tradition as followers of Jesus Christ and our commitment to social justice as the grounding for our life together. So they write, what is proportional giving? Proportional giving is offering to God in a commitment and faithful manner a portion of what God has given us to help guide all members of the church with their level of financial giving to the church, the annual stewardship committee prayerfully asks that each of us consider giving 3% to 10% of our gross income. These guidelines represent a significant shift from our most recent stewardship campaigns, which have suggested percentage increases over the previous year's gift. The annual stewardship committee is asking the congregation to embrace this opportunity by thinking in a new way about how to live your most generous life by loving generously and unleashing the power of the plate. So you and I have been asked to be proportional giver, givers. Let's respond to this invitation. We have been invited to invest in First Church in 2021 in a gentle, and clear way during these past four weeks of the annual stewardship campaign. So far, we have heard from 111 of, of the total of 276 households of faith that pledged last year. And by the way, if you didn't pledge last year, you're welcome to join the number and grow, grow, grow that number. Remember, don't bury things in the backyard. The pledges are coming in strong. 65 households have stepped up their giving over to 2019. So 65 of your households of faith have increased your pledged investments. Thank you and thanks be to God. Now we have 444,000, by the way, at 444 East Broad Street, that number is golden, but let's keep growing it. $444,563.96. Pledge toward our million dollar goal. Now, we are waiting to hear from 165 giving units that have pledged last year. 
And we only have 15 days left. So now is the time to wake up and respond. In fact, I would encourage you to listen to the end of the sermon, but also go right to the website at that point and pledge as you respond to proportional giving. I encourage you, if you're able to step up in that giving, to reach our goal will take generous people with a vision of proportional giving answering the power of the plate. Please join me and my family as we feel the power of the plate and pledge for 2021. The power of the plate key calls each of us to share our love with generosity. And by the way, this is not just an invitation to members of First Church. Many of you who have joined us over these months that we have been online, virtual, are listening again today. If you are a friend of First Church, if you have journeyed with us virtually in 2020, we can use your support too. We would like you to be one of the givers for 2021. We will continue live streaming services as Peter said in his acceptance today, after the pandemic is over and we will be back together again in our glorious Cathedral of Grace. You can come and join us here when we come back in. You can stay with us, you can grow with us in your faith. We would love for you to invest in First Church. It is the beacon on Broad Street in the heart of Ohio's capital city. It is the church that has the city in its heart. We will use all of your investments well and we promise not to bury anything in the yard. We will share them with the world as we care with abundant love for all. There's one simple and second message that I take away from Matthew 25. We have a magnificent treasure here. We have to share it. It will not flourish in the ground. We have to risk. We have to step up. We have to increase our treasure called First Church. We have to grow this treasure. We have to give like we mean it. Together we can get through these times and be in our magnificent space again. Together we become God's plan in this world and through our investments in First Church, we magnify and amplify God's message. We can only do this together, and we only can do it when love bubbles up inside of us and overflows into generosity. I hope and pray that you feel the power of the plate today. Will you step up in 2021 and keep us moving forward in faith? Please, we need you for this, we need each other for this. And may the power and poetry and prophecy of our judges, Deborah and Ruth, inspire us. And may the power of the plate strengthen us, each one of us, to give like we mean it. And may the power of God, which is truly the greatest power in this universe, give us love and generosity and guide us to put our love into action. Amen.